Thank you very much for this opportunity of sharing my knowledge and my love about Father Tsebula. It is impossible to sum up a whole life in just some minutes, so I will try to present you some of the objects I found uh, during my researches and to give you some points of um, reflection that uh, will need, uh, I will say, an ongoing curve, an ongoing reflection on these points. You know, maybe uh, what I would like to do is to encourage you to make more researches and um, reflections on those uh, moments in his life. I will share my screen, my presentation. Uh, yes. And you can place the image of my camera on that square uh, at the bottom of right hand, because I will reserve this place for, for, for you. I will not present any other object uh, in that particular spot of your screen. So welcome to this presentation. And uh, in Goldruf, Wielkopolski, there is one uh, church, Oblate Church, Oblate Parish, with this stained uh, window. Uh, with Father Blessed Yusuf Tsebula. There are four words that try to sum up his life. I will use these four words to introduce you to his life. Priest, educator, superior, and finally, martyr. Let us start with this, the first two words, priest and educator. When I was Reflecting on his life, I found that we cannot separate these two concepts. Uh, Father Tsebula, before joining the seminary, he was thinking about his future. He was planning to be a teacher. And uh, in the whole process, he found his uh, vocation to priesthood. So let us talk about these two words uh, together, priest and educator. He was born in Malnia, 23rd of March, 1902. Uh, Malnia is a very uh, small village in the Upper Silesia. We can see some of the objects, the house where he was born. And uh, he had two siblings. He was the eldest of these three children of Hadrian and Rosalia. Uh, then after Yusuf came Pavel and um, Maria. And we are looking at these um, books of prayers. These are kept in the family house in Malnia. These were the books of prayers used by little Yusuf and Pavel and Maria for their prayers. I had the opportunity of meeting the relatives uh, in, in Malnia and they showed me many of these objects I will present you today. There is this plaque on the wall of this house, uh, remembering that in this place, Blessed Tsebula was born. And there is one name, one street called after uh, Blessed Tsebula. This is the street leading to the uh, parish uh, church. But uh, uh, back on the day, there was no parish in this area. This was a very small village, so if even for the services, they have to go 
to the closest town. Now we have these icons. And the closest town, uh, that is this Otment, uh, today we have one parish, Our Lady of Presumption, in Krapkovice, Krak Otment. Uh, now it is uh, these two places, Krapkovice and Otment, are the same uh, town, but uh, before they used to have two different major halls. Krapkovice was one place, Otment another one. Mm -hmm. And we can see the baptismal baptism font where Blessed Cebula was baptized in uh, 1902. And this was the state of the church uh, in those days. It was in ruins. We can see here the record of his baptism, uh, his name, Yusuf. And uh, at the right hand, we can see even the note that he was beatified in 1999 by Pope John Paul II. In this church, Our Lady of the Assumption, he received First Communion in 1914. And uh, where this is a place where he celebrated his first Mass, 13th of June, 1927. Please keep in mind uh, this place, this moment of his first Mass, and also uh, this date, 13th of June. We will come back uh, afterwards to these two ideas. The region where he was born was Upper Silesia. What you can see today is a map of modern Germany and modern Poland. And you can see also the region of Upper Silesia. But back in the day, it was slightly different. Everything belonged to, let us say, Germany. And uh, you can see in that circle the region of Upper Silesia. And uh, in red uh, colors are shown uh, Catholic families, the proportion of Catholic families in the area. And this big proportion, these high levels of Catholic families in Upper Silesia is due to the Polish families living in the area. One of these families was the family of uh, Blessed Josef Cebula, and he was born and raised up as a Catholic. This is not the picture of those days. It is a very modern picture from 1977. But this is the very same school and the very same building where uh, Father Cebula started uh, his instruction. It was a, a primary school and all the education there was in German. It will uh, play, it will uh, develop a main role in the life of Blessed Cebula, this education in German. Because he uh, was educated in a patriotic spirit, so he tried to uh, pursue education in Polish. And it was impossible because of the circumstances of the day uh, in, in that particular moment. He got sick uh, and he ne needed medical cures. Uh, people doubted about whether he could follow his studies. He finally recovered and could, could continue his studies, but no longer in his uh, village school. He went to Lublinets uh, because he heard that uh, a priest, a Polish priest, Pavel Rogowski, opened a school and he uh, did the instruction in Polish. So this is why he left his village and uh, went to, to Lublinets to continue his studies, his uh, instruction in, in Polish. The interesting point is that this school uh, had as a building the very same minor seminary, oblate minor, minor seminary, where uh, the minor seminary of the province of Poland was established. And <coughs> this minor seminary, Father Cebula, was named superior. But it happened many years afterwards. Uh, he entered this school, uh, Pavel Gorogovsky's school. And uh, finally, Pavel Rogovsky left the building and the oblates came to this building uh, many years after. So you can see the map and the school. And uh, Blessed Cibula lived somewhere in front of the school uh, and the other side of the street. 
You can see now the, the map of many places we are referring to and we will continue referring to in the next slides. Opole, Lublinets, Malnia, Pekare, Shonske. As you can see, everything is in the same area. All these four places are very close to each other. And let us move to the next place uh, that it is called Pekare, Shonske. He was in Lublinets studying and he has some thoughts about his future about his vocation and uh, he was sent to Pikare Shonsky. This is a Marian shrine, very famous in the area. And the interesting point is that uh, Oble, Oblates in Poland established uh, the first uh, mission in this shrine. Uh, they were priests serving in the shrine. So when he arrived uh, in Pikari, uh, he entered the shrine, prayed, in front of the statue, uh, sorry, not the statue, but the icon, the icon of Our Lady of Pekari, and he talked to a priest. That priest was an oblate of Mary Immaculate, Father Jan Pawolek, one of the pioneers, one of the first Polish oblates, and uh, he shared with Father Pawolek uh, his thoughts about uh, his vocation, that he was looking for uh, the path set by God for his uh, life. Interesting point. All these great men, and sorry, uh, now I see that uh, my picture is covering uh, one more face. All these four important oblates, uh, Father Cebula, Scholastic Alphonse Manka, Father Ludwig Brodarczyk, and the fourth one, uh, brother uh, Kowalczyk, they all of them passed through Piekary Shionski, through this shrine, more or less at the same time, and all of them found the inspiration for their vocation in this particular shrine. Maybe this could be one of those points we could reflect more, how Our Lady brought uh, these people to their vocation as Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Another interesting fact, this uh, father, Father Jan Pawolek, was also killed in Auschwitz concentration camp. You can see his image from the records from the concentration camp. You know, this la the last images we have from Father uh, Pawolek. Father Pawolek told him to go to Krotoshin. Because in this house, you can see on your screen, Oblates established a sort of minor seminary. So, uh, Father Cebula, oh, sorry, <coughs> the little boy uh, Yusuf Cebula went to Krotoshin to continue thinking about his vocation and is studying in this uh, house. Very interesting fact this house was the very first house owned by the Oblates in Poland, and this is the, the crèche in Francais, uh, the cradle, I think, in English, for, of our uh, congregation in Poland. He pursued his studies for baccalaureate uh, in this house. You can see the little boy, uh, Cebula. There were uh, 27 students, five priests and five Oblate brothers in that community. He achieved his baccalaureate in 1921. And then he decided to enter the novitiate in Markovice in 1921. He arrived in August, and one year later, he made his first vows in this very uh, novitiate house. This is a shrine, not only the novitiate house, this is a very famous shrine in the area. Uh, Matki Boże Królowej Miłości Pokoju Pan. You can see the picture of a uh, little boy or youngster, Josef Cebula, as a uh, novice. And I found another picture. Uh, the relatives of Father Cebula keep this. Uh, picture you can see at the uh, bottom part uh, on the left side. He was very humble and uh, shy. Somehow 
who always was shy. You can see more other pictures. Uh, as a grown man, and he always has this image of being uh, somehow timid or shy. And uh, his uh, life was, first of all, a deeper inner life. Not everything was passing through his heart and through his mind before uh, being said, uh, being put in words. This is a, a interior of the church in uh, Markovice, uh, the Novitiate. Today, you can see the portrait of Blessed Cebula on the uh, on on the ceiling of the church, and some rooms as they were when Father Cebula, novice Cebula, was living here. Now there are some plagues remembering that he was uh, declared blessed. After uh, his novitiate and his first bowls, he was sent for his scholastic aid to Liège in Belgium. And he spent one year in Liège. Even though it was a short time, but uh, this left a very deep trace in the spirituality of Blessed Sebula. Liège was an international seminary. Uh, seminarians coming from different parts of the world, especially from Europe, came here for receiving the studies in philosophy and theology. There were 53 seminarists or seminarians from France, Alsace-Lorraine, Spain, Poland, and Belgium. And his formator wrote about him that he was an excellent religious, a good worker, he had a good judgment and a good heart. I said that this experience in Liege um, left a deep uh, trust, a uh, deep, deep uh, sign in his spirituality because he learned of the spirituality of the Sacred Heart. Uh, you know, the famous shrine uh, in Montmartre in Paris. Uh, Oblates were there from the very first beginning. We started the construction of this uh, shrine and our congregation was dedicated to the shrine, uh, so, sorry, to the Sacred Heart in 1873. And we received as a particular task of our congregation from the Pope, we received the task of spreading the devotion to the Sacred Heart and especially to spreading this scapula of uh, Jesus and Mary. And our mission was of Oblates of Mary Immaculate was spreading this scapula throughout the whole church. And it was a task received from the Pope. Now, the interesting point is, in the, is that in Belgium, the King of uh, Belgium wanted to create a similar shrine to the most sacred heart of Jesus. And Oblates, once again, were the first chaplains of this very famous shrine uh, in Kockelberg. So, Blessed Cebula, when he was an scholastic, he learned of this spirituality and of this uh, scapula of the Sacred Heart. And what you can see now on your screen is one of the few objects, personal objects, that remains from the times of Blessed Cebula and is kept in the family, uh, Cebula family till today. This is a scapula of the Sacred Heart with a medal of the Sacred Heart, before being arrested and being deported to Germany and then to Austria for, for being exterminated, he left this scapula to his some neighbors, and these neighbors gave the scapula to the family. So he always bore this scapula of the Sacred Heart of Jesus till the last moment when he was arrested. In 1923, he returned to Poland, to Lublin, and again, he found his uh, path to the priesthood when he, was, when he was desiring to become a teacher. And when he was already on his path to priesthood, he developed this mission of being teacher of minor seminarians. He was a major seminarian of the Oblates, and he received the mission of instructing 
other minor seminarians in Lublin while he was uh, pursuing uh, his studies of theology in Lublin. There are 120 young people's, pupils there, and he was one of the staff, uh, teachers and staff, even though he didn't have final goals. Finally, in 1925, he made his final goals in Kropia. You can see the oblation formula and the oblate cross he received that particular day. Now, Kropia is one of the two scholasticates the Polish province had in those days in Poland. And this is a place where Father Cebula made his final goals. And you can see a very small chapel in this facility that it is owned by the state today, by, but we serve every week masses here in this chapel. 5th of June, 1927, he received the ordination to the priesthood in, his, in the private chapel of the Bishop Lisiecki in Katowice. The cathedral was still under construction, so this is why he received priesthood in one of these rooms of this uh, palace of the bishop. And he celebrated Mass, 13 of June, 1927. He celebrated his first Mass in his parish in Otman. This was the state of the parish already when he celebrated the first Mass. Now, the important thing is this uh, first Mass celebration. Because we can see on the prayer cards he distributed uh, after the Mass, we can see the two things he chose as uh, inspiration, inspirational words for his priesthood. First sentence, it is taken from the Bible, from the book of Psalms. I will sing forever the goodness of the Lord. Second phrase, this is the oblate motto. He has sent me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. Evangelizare pauperibus missit me. In a good German, if you, uh, not in a mistake, maybe Thomas Kloster can, can, can tell me if it is a good German or not. It's approved. <laughs> okay, approved, good. So we can see the records of his uh, path to the priesthood. Uh, all the steps taken, minor seminary, novitiate, and uh, priesthood. And we can follow to the third word, superior. Blessed Cebula was immediately made superior of the minor seminary in Lublin, because in the words of the provincial, although he is young, he has maturity of a spirit. Again, we see all these places we are referring to, uh, all of them in the same area of Poland. They were working on the construction of this chapel in those days. I don't believe that this stained window we can see here representing uh, our founder, Saint Eugene de Mazenot, in front of Our Lady, was in the times of Blessed Cebula, uh, superior of this house. I don't have the records, but uh, somehow it is interesting to see here the new building and uh, our founder in that building. Now we can see uh, in a statue and different portraits of Blessed Cebula in this religious house. And again, we see Father Cebula now as a priest, but being formator, being teacher, being educator for 276 pupils studying in this, uh, in this uh, apostolic school with the minor seminarians. 10 fathers, 10 oblate brothers in the community. And it was said that he was a very good formator, even uh, his provincial superior always said that everyone is enchanted by him, by his approach to the people. Maybe this is one of the reasons why he was elected as provincial in 1936, but he refused. He said, I have a very poor health. I don't feel that I am strong enough to visit the different people, communities in Poland, 
and to fulfill this task. So what you can see on your screen are, is the correspondency between him and the central government, the general administration. Uh, he said in this letter, you can see in the center that um, I am at your disposal. I don't feel that I'm good enough for fulfilling this duty, but I am at your disposal, even if you, uh, Father General, want to continue with your plans of making me your provincial of Poland. Finally, he was made the first consular of the uh, province with a special powers. Somehow, like uh, today, we could say the, the provincial vicar of the province. He left the Lublinets, uh, but before leaving the place, he constructed this uh, grotto to Our Lady. We can see till today in Lublinets. This is Father Cebula who constructed this grotto. And he went to Marco Dice to be the superior of the novitiate, the master of novices. Here we can see him as a superior of novices in Marco Vizzi. And again, he was very beloved by the novices and the formation staff. His predecessor as master of novices praised him a lot. Father Joseph desires to make community life more and more human. He is a better educator than, than me. He follows the novices like a shadow and is a man of very deep inner life. His spiritual life, life is based on the rule and fidelity to the daily regulations. He was below. Another interesting moment and that uh, merits our attention. In this place, Markovice, three people that um, now are on the way, on the, uh, it's their way to be declared saints or uh, martyrs, met together. Blessed Cebula, the servant of God, the scholastic uh, Alphonse Manka, and the servant of God, Father Ludwig Grodarczyk. And all of them live together in this community and prepare themselves for martyrdom in this community and were taken from this community for being killed. Father Ludwig Grodarczyk went to modern Ukraine and was killed some years later in 1943 and a scholastic Alphonse Manka was killed in 1941 in Mauthausen-Gusen, same concentration camp, but another part of the concentration camp where Blessed Cebula was killed. 1st of, November, of September 1939, uh, we know the, this very famous picture, uh, Germany enters in, uh, in, in Poland and Second World War begins. You can see on the map, the location of Markovice and the movements of the troops on that day. So Markovice was in the area of the movements of German troops. Immediately, uh, the convent, the, the religious house of Markovice was occupied by uh, German troops. Uh, the scholastics from other areas uh, in Obra and Krovia before the German troops enter in 1st of September, they thought that Markovice will be a most uh, 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 safe uh, place, and this is why they, they arrived to, to, to the novitiate. 4th of September, uh, in, this, in the midst of this confusion, uh, there were uh, the perpetual professions of the scholastics. Dear brothers, the situation is serious, said Blessed Cebula, and he couldn't continue. Then he burst into tears. And this is why the uh, retreat as in preparation for the first votes was interrupted on 4th of September uh, many seminarians and novices had to leave for other places in Poland, uh, Goden, for instance, or the Holy Cross religious house. Some of them never returned. Five were killed in different places. 
12, 12 novices and 16 postulants came back to Markovice because they didn't find any refuge and they continue living there. All of them, they came back tired and hungry. Some members went to Strelno. This is a place close to Markovice. And uh, because in this place, in the Strelno, Jeno von Egan Krieger, uh, commander of the German officer, uh, was uh, uh, saying that uh, they will be safe in this place. Jeno von Egan Krieger, uh, it was sought as a, a friend of the community, and after he proved that he, he was not such a friend because uh, 5 of October, he forced the community, among them Alphonse Manka, to work in his, uh, in the, in the near, nearby German farms, uh, close to Markovice. The Gestapo raided the convent and forced the entire community, a father, 17 theology students, and 35 brothers, novices, and scholastics, to hard labor in those farms. Otherwise, the superior, that means Yusuf Tsebula, will be killed. So 46 oblates were forced to work on Yeno von Egan Krieger's land, and the other 14 were forced to work in the uh, area around Markovice, uh, religious house of the oblates, in order to produce food for the German troops. And only a little part of this food uh, could be retained by the community for uh, sustaining the community and uh, oblates were forced to trade in black markets with this little food that remained for the community for getting another uh, goods, sugar and other goods for the community. During the occupation, the formation continued. So during the day, they were forced to, to work for German troops, and during the night, they continued their formation. Uh, in clandestinity. Novices made their religious profession on 7 of October 1939. Postulants began their novitiate on 10 October 1939. And Blessed Cibula was their formator. Of course, this is not a picture from Markovice. This is a clandestine mass in China. And we can see in the Museum of the Postulation in Rome, we have the orders uh, received uh, by Father Cebula to present himself before German troops. And many times he had to present himself in the quarters. Jeno von Egan Krieger became an increasingly ruthless enemy against the Oblates. So three priests of the community, Oblates, were taken as hostages to Strelno. One of them was immediately killed, Father Marian Viduba, in one of the forests around Strelno. We don't have time. I have to make my presentation short, sorry. Uh, then other novices and people were taken to Sheglin, one of the concentrations camp, and among them, Alphonse Manka. Then they were taken to Dachau, and to Mauthausen Gusen, where Alphonse Manka, for instance, was killed. Father Tsebula could only bless these scholastics and novices that were taken to Mauthausen Gusen. You can see Chegli, near Markovice, the first, let us say, concentration camp. Uh, where these scholastics and novices were, were taken to. So now the role of superior of Blessed Cebula, it was not easy for him to be superior in this condition. He was the one who has to communicate the relatives and the parents that uh, these scholastics disappear and we do not know where they are right now. These are the parents of Alphonse Manka. Alphonse is no longer here. On Saturday, he went with others to work in Germany. This is the only thing uh, the superior of the community, Blessed Cebula, could tell to the relatives of Alphonse Manka and other scholastics. And finally, 
we can say of him that he was martyr, the last war. 26 of August, 1940, Father Cibula was taken with three other confers to Sheglino, and then he was, uh, only he, he was allowed to come back to Markovice. The, uh, all three confers continued the persecution and they were taken to different places, uh, concentration camp. Blessed Cibula was allowed to return to Markovice just to be guardian and caretaker of the religious house. The convent was used uh, as uh, facilities for a Hitler youth, Hitlerian youth. Hitler's policy was clear. Priests and religious who profess a doctrine that does not conform to Hitler's must be eliminated. Father Cebula is drastically forbidden any pastoral ministry. He lives there just with two oblate brothers working in the lands. But he was a clandestine priest. He people continued their life, so he wanted to receive Holy Communion. Uh, he got sick, so he wanted to receive the sacrament for the sick, anointing of sick. They got uh, married, so uh, Father Cebula blessed their marriages, baptized children, etc. He was the only priest in the area. And he was said that he was close to them. He is our priest. We have some records of clandestine celebrations of marriages. And uh, this family said he was our priest. The celebration was wonderful, even though it was celebrated in clandestinity. But that was the reason of his martyrdom. Uh, he was several times uh, threatened with death if he continued his ministry. Finally, 2 of April 1941, he was arrested. He was probably denounced by a local woman. He was taken to Inovrotslau concentration camp. We can see here the facilities of this concentration camp that was standing in this area. After a few days spent in the, that area, Blessed Cebula, together with Blessed Bishop Michal Kozal, another priest, were taken to Oh, I cannot pronounce it. So maybe Father Closer come. Sachsenhausen. Sachsenhausen. Like hey, that. Sachsenhausen. A concentration camp near Berlin. I cannot tell this word. Sorry. And finally, to Mauthausen in Austria. This is a concentration camp at Mauthausen. Now, I have to give you this warning. I will present you graphic content of, of tortures and violence. So, if uh, it could uh, offend your sensibility, it's better to uh, switch your uh, screen off and just to listen my voice. So, Father Cebula arrived um, to Mauthausen. And he immediately saw what uh, the practices, horrible practices there. This is the last picture we have of uh, Father Tsepula that was taken before being arrested. Uh, he was wearing civilian clothes. The priest is called to be another Jesus, Alter Christus, also Alter Christus in his passion. And this is the vocation of Father Cebula, to be priest and alter Christus. And, and to identify himself with the sacrifice he is offering, uh, the same Jesus Christ offering himself in the Eucharist and on the cross. He received the number 70, and you can see on this depict, and this depict the number 17. Mm -hmm that was given to him. And immediately he received the violence in different ways, humiliation, he was undressed, he stood naked, and then he started to remove, hardly remove his hair from his body, even before his most intimate parts. At each of his moans, sometimes involuntary, of course, he was hit on the head with a tonsure. 
Then he was taken to the shower room for a brutal disinfestation, now with a very hot water, now with very cold water. And he was continuing being beaten several times. We know that he was in the barrack number seven here on the screen. You can see the barrack where he was. One of the uh, witnesses said, in our block came a tall, pale man with an ascetic face and a strange name, Cebula, that means onion. In his attitude, there was a certain dignity as if he were in the presence of a mystery, that is the mystery of Christ Jesus. But also received in the very first hours in Mauthausen, uh, many tortures. Uh, he was beaten many times and he lost consciousness several times. He, he was given a rope to help himself with. Just make it easy. Huh? Kill yourself. It will be faster. Hmm? Father Cebula wouldn't neither eat nor lie down on his own. And he was invited to recite prayers and to sing religious songs in order to mock him. Now, that is one of the most powerful mysteries in this story of Father Cebula. As it happened with Jesus, that when he was crucifying him, they thought that they were the winners. They are defeating Jesus Christ. Now, when they were inviting Blessed Cebula to recite prayers or to sing religious songs, they thought they were mocking him. In fact, they were allowing Blessed Cebula to fulfill his own desire the day when he received his ordination. Remember that prayer card. I will sing forever the goodness of the Lord, forever, at every time in any circumstances, even here in Mauthausen concentration camp. I can sing and I will do it forever, the goodness of the Lord. He had to identify himself with Jesus Christ. But there was this kind of majesty as the witnesses told about Blessed Cebula. And we can imagine Blessed Cebula those days uh, praying in clandestinity. Uh, this is a picture made by David Oler, who was a survivor from Mauthausen concentration camp. And he depicted what he saw. And uh, these rosaries we found in many places, many concentration camps made from breadcrumbs. So imagine Blessed Cebula also praying in captivity. Well, now. The important thing, Mauthausen was not a concentration camp. It was an extermination camp. Those who arrived to Mauthausen uh, knew that they were taken there just to be killed. So he was assigned to forced labors in the quarry. Uh, the work there was so heavy and it was so hard. Taking materials for the construction of the new cities of Vienna and Linz. On May 1941, he was forced to carry stones so heavy that he could not even lift them. Two prisoners were charged with placing them on his shoulders, supporting him and moving him forward, as the Syrian had done with Jesus. Blessed Cebula started his own way of the cross to the Golgotha to offer himself in sacrifice together with Jesus. He had to climb uh, this mountain through the uh, steps of death. People, sorry, people uh, were constrained to, to go up these uh, steps. And even if someone will fall down while climbing these steps, the other people had to pass over him to step on them. So many people just were crushed against 
the, the, the soil against the same steps. This is why when Father Cebula reached the top of the hill, he said to the guardians, you think you are the bosses, the couple, but remember there is one above us and he will judge you for your actions. At these words, the guardians told him to go to run to, to these fences so that people on the towers, the other guardians on the towers, could shoot him. It was a normal practice. And people on the guardians, they were not confused, on the towers, they were not confused. They knew that it was just a pretext given by his, uh, their friends uh, to shoot at the, at the prisoners. But it was a pretext saying he was trying to run away. And this was the way how Father Tzibula died. As he felt, he, priest of Jesus crucified, his arms outstretched, he embraced the world. These are some oblates during the pandemics, laying down and praying before going on mission. His body was removed and was taken to the oven for incineration. One of the men working in the oven said that when they tried to put the body in, he uh, seemed to move his hands as if he wanted to bless the world. Now, these people ran away immediately from the oven. But think, please, before being somehow cynical and saying, okay, maybe it's a normal reaction of the body when you put it into contact with the flames, that it is true, there are different chemical reactions. It is true. Father Diego, thank you very much, but... One, one minute and I will finish. One okay. minute. Just last word. Be, before thinking of that, please think, these people were used to know that uh, the, these different chemical reactions and they never run away from the oven. At this time, they run away. Okay, this is how the story of Blessed Cebula finishes by entering into the hell of the humanity in this particular point of Mauthausen to be risen with Christ. And this is the hope we have and what Blessed uh, St. John Paul II said during the beatification of Blessed Cebula in 1999. These men never abandoned his ministry. Thank you very much for your attention.